thank you very much for the invitation to speak here this evening. I too would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which uh, this evening's forum is being, is being held. Of course, a very timely forum. Um, today is the 26th of October. Um, of course, the Russian Revolution, or October Revolution, uh, occurred on the 25th, 26th of October, or actually 25th, uh, in the old Russian calendar. So we're actually running a week ahead in exact times in terms of uh, the revolution itself, in terms of the modern calendar, which is the 7th of November. But anyway, let's not, a small, uh, let's not let a small issue like that get in the way. It clearly isn't. So the question of the Russian Revolution and its relevance today. I actually think, found thinking about this topic, it's actually a more challenging topic than, you, than certainly I uh, initially thought. Especially, I think, when we're looking at this revolution 100 years ago that occurred in vastly different circumstances from those in which we live, we in this room at least, live in this country, in the antipodes, so to speak, um, in an advanced capitalist country, more precisely, actually, on what I would call a colonial settler state with all the problems that that entails, not least the disposition of its indigenous people. So I say that because I think it is very important to recognize that the Russian Revolution occurred in a very different society. As Hannah's already indicated, this was geographically a vast, ethnically diverse, semi-industrialized agrarian society, predominantly with an illiterate peasantry, an impoverished peasantry, um, a small industrial working class, and an extremely repressive um, and brutal autocracy. The revolution that actually issued from uh, from within the, uh, uh, the Russian Empire, as it was called, <coughs> did not actually fit the classical Marxist script for a socialist <coughs> revolution. The classic Marxists, I think you know who they are, <coughs> had, had anticipated that socialism would basically be uh, established in the advanced capitalist countries. But the Bolsheviks, essentially, one wing of the, social, of the Russian Social Democrats, took issue with that and argued that, in fact, the revolution that they could initiate, they would initiate in Russia, in, uh, in an underdeveloped country, if I can put it that way, would be the opening sal salvo in an international revolution, in an international socialist revolution. I can't stress that too strongly. They fervent, firmly believed that when they took power in October of 1917, and of course there was a whole period of, of 1917 in which they're debating these issues, but they firmly believed that their revolution would be consummated, so to speak, by revolutions in Europe and above all in Germany. And that didn't happen for reasons that I can't go into, but basically you could say those revolution, the revolution in Germany was crushed. And that was catastrophic, actually, for the revolution itself, that is, the revolution that took place in October, and the subsequent course of the Soviet Union uh, itself. It meant, I won't dwell on it, but a catastrophic civil war that just about obliterated, for example, the working class, reduced the, the, the country to uh, virtually, virtually um, well, extremely primitive conditions. Let's put it in those term, terms. And then, of course, subsequently, there was the Nazi invasion of the Soviet Union. So, uh, in that sense, those circumstances are far removed from the, the circumstances that we, we face today. It's generally said that we live in a so-called post-industrial world, that the classical proletariat no longer exists or has been transformed. The question of land reform that was such a big issue for uh, Marxists in, in, in Russia were, was 
is one that, that doesn't confront us in the same, when I say us, the socialist movement in the same way, even in the underdeveloped world. Not to the same degree, at least. And, so far, we have not been engulfed by a total war. Though, of course, if you listen to some of the words coming out of the White House, you get the feeling that, in fact, in fact if Trump had his opportunity, he would do exactly that. So, um, that doesn't mean, of course, that we can't draw lessons from this, this revolution. There's one other, other point that I want to make, and I hope I don't spend too long making it, and that is that from day one, basically, the Russian Revolution, and again, I think ha Hannah's made this point quite clearly, didn't get, if I can put it this way, a good press, to say the least. Winston Churchill, that icon of, British, of the British Empire, said in 1920, or spoke in 1920, of a Bolshevist catastrophe, and I quote, a deadly and paralyzing sect that destroyed Russia and plunged it into deep, in unspeakable misery. Well, as somebody who, of course, was the architect, amongst other things, of the triumph in the Dardanelles, he would know about such things. And of course, the notion of... <laughs> of course, um, he wasn't the last person to put socialism in a bad light, and particularly in its Soviet incarnation. Uh, Ronald Reagan infamously referred to it as, Ron uh, as an evil empire. And I noticed recently, by the way, that the federal treasurer has actually resuscitated some of this anti-socialist rhetoric and has described, I think, Bill Shorten as a socialist of the East German type, which seems a bit... <laughs> well, I don't know whether it's... I'm a little bit misplaced, but anyway. So, furthermore, I think for um, the modern generation... Well, in the, in the 21st century, particularly... The revolution of 1917 seems to be discredited in part by the experience of Stalinism and even more latterly by the demise of the Soviet Union itself, which was indeed seen as a triumph of capitalism, the end of history, the end of Marxism, the end of socialism. And Margaret Thatcher, if you remember her, you don't have to, but if you do remember her, spoke about Tina. There is no alternative. So basically, for about the last two decades, if not three, of the 20th century, there was a pretty good um, move to expunge the idea of possibility of, of, of socialism in the 21st century, that's for sure. And yet I suggest, if I can take a, a quote from uh, Galileo, and yet it moves. In other words, despite all of this it seems to me that the Russian Revolution, of which Hannah spoke in, in some detail, still resonates today, perhaps more, in fact, I think a lot more than a lot of people realize. Even if they don't realize it, especially the younger generation, nevertheless, many of the issues that actually the, the, the Bolsheviks were confronting and not they alone, but let's focus on them tonight. The current neoliberal world, neoliberal capitalism, faces extremes of wealth and poverty, underdevelopment, wars, mass refugees, economic crisis, and with it the precariat that's been created, insecurity of life, racial and gender brutalization and oppression, and the emergence of something that I think is a particularly concerning phenomenon, particularly in the course of the so-called war on terror, the development of an authoritarian surveillance state. And perhaps lastly, of course, the current world is faced by an existential crisis. That is, the survival of uh, our planet, an Anthropocene crisis, the crisis basically uh, generated by, um, essentially, capitalism itself. Rosa Luxemburg, of course, famously said in 1916 that the world faced a choice between barbarism and socialism, and I think it's reasonable to say 
that we face a choice between socialism and extinction. That's basically the way I put the term. I don't want to, how can I say, make, turn this into a sort of apocalyptic scenario. Uh, but I think there are big issues at stake. <laughs> I've got a detractor in the audience, I don't know. <laughs> okay, so having said all that, we need to bear in mind that actually revolutions are, are rare events. They don't happen every day. We can name uh, three or four key ones. The French, there's a good start. The Russian, the Cuban, the Chinese. I'm sure others could add to them, but these are quite important in the sense that, as far as I'm concerned, revolution adds up to uh, the replacement of one form of state power by another, propelled by mass movements. And that's basically what occurred in 1917. Very often, by the way, um, in the professional historiography of, about the Russian Revolution, the term that's used to, do, to refer to the Russian Revolution of October 1917 is a coup. That's the most popular term. Not actually a revolution, not a change in the form of state power, not something, not a process driven by a popular movement that was harnessed by, in particular, the Bolsheviks. And not, but not them alone, by the way. So it's very important, I think, to bear that in mind. Furthermore, I'd say the image that has been given of the revolution and the subsequent course of Soviet history, one of almost, particularly on the most extreme wing of this sort of literature, is of a violent process um, and a ferocious civil war. If you think about revolution, you're actually, I believe, supposed to think in those terms, apocalyptic terms, if you like. But that, I'd suggest, has masked the October Revolution's emancipatory aims and consequences. And I want to turn as quickly as I can to some of those right now. So, you've all heard, or you've certainly heard tonight, if you haven't heard it before, the slogan, peace, land and bread, that the Bolsheviks uh, utilised throughout 1917. I've always been actually uh, somewhat, well, amazed by the simplicity of that, those three things. You could almost say those three de demands, the call, call for peace, basically an end to the war, and we're talking about a war on a scale that nobody had ever experienced before, Land, because people were start, sorry, land because peasants were seeking uh, uh, the redistribution of land in an underdeveloped country, um, details of which I obviously can't go into, and bread because people were starving in these circumstances. And on the basis of those elementary, uh, those slogans, they captured, I think, the elementary aspirations of millions, of desperate millions for an end to the carnage for land redistribution, and for food. And interesting in that regard, I think it's what was really acute about the Bolsheviks is they understood quite clearly that the provisional government, which existed between the overthrow of the Tsarist regime and their subsequent rise to power on the back of this Soviet movement writ large, they understood could not be and would not be satisfied. So they were, they were actually peaceniks in that sense. I, I emphasize that fact because of that image of them. If you see so many images of the, of the Bolshevik Revolution, they're usually associated with bayonets and that sort of thing. And it was a violent time. Let's not, I don't want to put a gloss on this period. But nevertheless, peace, that was a critical cry that they, they uttered, the need for peace, and it was answered. And in fact, the very first decree enunciated, if you enunciate a decree, issued, I suppose, um, of the new Soviet government was a decree on peace, which amongst other things said, right, basically they were just saying, let's stop going to war. Well, that, I'd suggest, actually terrified the warring powers, Germany, Britain, and so forth. The idea of millions of primarily peasant soldiers putting down their arms and leaving the battlefield was too much to bear. 
Furthermore, um, these people, and I say these people, these Bolsheviks, were against secret diplomacy. So it was they, by the way, and it was actually the uh, foreign, Commissar for Foreign Affairs, uh, Leon Trotsky, who issued a decree, not, no, put it another way, he did issue a decree, but he actually published the documents about the division of uh, the Middle East under the secret Sykes-Picot agreement. We wouldn't even know about that. So in that sense, if it wasn't for them, so in that sense, you could almost say the Bolsheviks were the WikiLeaks of their time. I don't know whether Trotsky's Julian Assange, but anyway, it doesn't matter. <laughs> you just sort of hold that image in your head for a little while. <laughs> okay. You don't have to. It's not compulsory. <laughs> okay, so we've already heard, but I, I, I think it's really worth reiterating the importance of the women's movement in this revolution. Because it broke out in, both, in the, um, let me get this right, the new calendar, March 8th, February 23, in the old calendar. It broke out on the, the first revolution, so to speak, that is, that culminates in the overthrow of the Tsar, actually took place on International Women's Day, began on International Women's Day. And there were mass demonstrations actually initiated by striking Petrograd women textile workers. So it wasn't just any women. There was, of course, well, not of course, but there was the meshing of class and women's uh, emancipation in this process because out of that uh, militancy, which generally speaking, by the way, just meant marches, demonstrations, not running around... Uh, shooting people, but marches and demonstrations for peace, for bread, and so forth. The culmination of that was along the way, and then after October 1917, women's suffrage, civil marriages, divorce, legal abortion, ultimately equal pay, land and property rights, and eventually literacy. All of the things that they basically did not have as um, non-citizens under the old Tsarist regime. And in doing so, they challenged the roots of uh, women's oppression, particularly the patriarchal family. And two really important figures in that regard are Alexandra Kolontai and Inessa Armand. Um, they, were head of, they were the heads, amongst others, of the Genadil, the Women's Commission, which sat under, which was part of the, the Communist Party Commission, which unfortunately was disbanded in 1930 by Stalin. Very important point that Colin Tai makes, actually. Um, I won't go into her debate with Lenin, but it's pretty clear she believed, and this, I think, is, really does have resonance today, especially in the midst of this uh, same-sex marriage debate about which we have to have a postal vote and so forth. She believed that uh, in sexual emancipation, believed that familial and sexual liberation were prerequisites for social emancipation. So that's a very, I'd suggest that's actually quite a modern idea in, in many respects. And by the way, just in passing, um, in effect in 1922, uh, the new Soviet regime also uh, decriminalized male homosexuality. That was later reversed in 1933. But nevertheless, Russia in 1922, in where such things were unheard of, let alone in Europe writ large, or the rest of the world. So you can see why, it seems to me, <laughs> there is a real relevance in this revolution that seems so far away in both time and place. I can't go into all the details. Maybe um, I've got too many words in front of me. Um, we could talk about some more issues in, in discussion. But a couple of points I just want to skip through and then perhaps we could open it up for discussion. There's no doubt that uh, class as a category of understanding was critical for the Bolsheviks. And in 1917, I'd say class really uh, eclipsed but didn't um, marginal, didn't necessarily, did not at all negate the question of, say, gender or women's rights. Furthermore, um, the question of 
of political power was critical in what they did. So I, said, I mentioned that slogan of uh, peace, land and bread and so forth. But of course, another important slogan that they had was, a very important slogan was, all power to the Soviets, which they clung to. Now again, I don't see any Soviets on the horizon, but nevertheless, in that context, that sort of demand for all power to these really what were popular, what we call in modern terms civil society organisations, that basically uh, off, had the prospect of democratising not just institutions but establishing a democratisation of society seems to me something that a per, an idea that I think is probably more timely, if not necessarily in that form, now than ever, when we can see before our very eyes the erosion of our basic democratic rights, especially since the war on terror, which has never actually struck this country to my knowledge, but and yet we've had successive bits, pieces of legislation that have given uh, the police, the state, the ASIO, and I don't know, there must be others, a greater authority over our lives. So, so that seems to me to be a, a, a point for in terms of the relevance, particularly I think in terms of our demands for democracy in this society. Political leaders pay lip service to that. But when you hold them to account, that can be, I think, a powerful, a powerful weapon. A simple one in terms of make, drawing the discrepancy between um, the rhetoric and the reality. I could certainly go on about that. I'll try and encapsulate just a few more ideas, and that is the internationalism of this revolution was critical, and it didn't just extend to Germany, it certainly extended to the colonial world. Indeed, um, self-determination was, was crucial, but interestingly enough, in December of 1917, the Bolsheviks also made an appeal to the Islamic peoples, calling for a holy war against imperialism. It's a very interesting idea, especially, of course, when we're supposedly involved in a, uh, a clash of civilizations, the Western world against the Islamic world and so forth, with all the negative rhetoric about, of, of that. And I think that question could certain their approach certainly has important I implications for uh, the current, for how we, as I would assume, secular socialists take up uh, solidarity with the countries, particularly of the Muslim world and so forth, as opposed to, say, the way those causes have, frankly, in my opinion, been hijacked by uh, apocalyptic, um, and dare I say it, somewhat, well, terroristic um, movements. Perhaps again, we can talk about that. Finally, I mentioned internationalism. It seems to me in a global world, that's an element that is more important than ever. But just one last point I'd like to make, and I think that it, it might seem a, little, a slightly odd one with all the uh, harsh reality that both Hannah and I have been talking about in terms of the problems, the challenges that this revolution faced. But I think the idea, and I take it from an essay of, uh, that I read some time ago, but I really love the title, The Necessity of Utopia. That is, the necessity to believe in the pos what's pos what is possible, even if it seems unrealistic. Mm -hmm. It seems to me that the Bolsheviks in 1917 actually had that in spades, because they were going against orthodoxy and said, yes, but, said, yes, we can actually, we can do this. They were audacious enough to do that. It cost them in the end, but they did it. And it seems to me that that kind of uh, you, well, let's call it utopianism, if you like, is it, uh, more important than ever, especially for younger generations who are coming, I think, who are now beginning to think in current circumstances about, uh, more positively anyway, about what was hitherto almost a dirty word, socialism. The fact that Bernie Sanders in the US can mention this. And of course, there's Jeremy Corbyn from Momentum, who strikes a chord with young people, I saw him give a speech at a, at, at a mass rally. Uh, not, it wasn't a rally, actually. It was a concert of young people, way younger than him, by the way. Um, and he said to them, he's quoting from Shelley, he said, <laughs> as a preface to a concert, could you believe it? 
He told them they should rise like lions. And they did. They all got up and clapped him. So I don't know whether rise like, rise like lions is the equivalent of all power to the Soviets, but uh, <laughs> it seems to me that maybe it could be the starting point. I'll leave it at that.